Real estate investing is a relationship business, and some of the best people you're ever going to meet, you meet at the bottom. Here's the story of how I met my first and most longest standing, highly trusted business partner. Stay tuned. You have asked how I met my business partner Linton and I'm gonna do my best to give you that story in 20 minutes or less and I hope I'm able to do it justice so I actually met Linton in a much different light than I meet much of you guys that want to come in and learn how to invest Linton called me up out of a newspaper ad and a postcard that I mailed to him at a house in Teaneck that he had purchased in his mother's name Linton had actually been taken advantage of by an unscrupulous real estate investor who had him purchase a house in his mother's name in Teaneck, a house in Saddlebrook, New Jersey in his name, and another house in Montclair, New Jersey in his uncle's name. He was then compensated with $30,000 to maintain these properties while his mentor was supposed to walk them through the rehabs and the rentals. However, his mentor just left. So, enter Chuck. I got the phone call when they were just about one month down on this particular property that they owned on Queen Anne Road in Teaneck, New Jersey. And I got there, I walked around, I looked at it, I showed him everything. He had told me what he was trying to do. I was actually going through a little bit of a dry spell myself, even though I had made $200,000 the previous year. I hadn't closed a deal yet this year and it was early spring. I was feeling kind of bummed out and I reached into my wallet and I carried around photocopies of the checks from all my closings just so I could remind myself what it is that I was capable of because sometimes it'll really f*** with your head when you're not getting a paycheck every week even though you just made 200 grand for some reason not having that monthly or weekly income that we've been trained to recognize seems to just make you think that you're broke or something's wrong and it's something you guys are going to have to fix yourself. It's a mindset thing. So, Linton shows me the house. I tell him everything. I reach in my wallet. I show him the checks. His eyes bug out of his head. He tells me the story. The house is in his mother's name. I agree to go meet with him later that night at his mother's house down the road. I meet there. He's telling his mother everything that I'm going to do. We go through the paperwork. Same purchase and sales agreement that I give you guys with the course if you want it. It's on the bottom. Hit the link. And I give his mother a $10 deposit. She refuses to take it. I tell her that she needs to. I eventually leave it on the windowsill. I think it's actually still there to this day, Mrs. Gentles. I think she dusts around it. She didn't believe anything. They signed off on everything. And I knew this was a pretty bad situation when it got a couple more months into foreclosure and it started to actually destroy Linton's mother's credit so badly that she actually disowned him and kicked him out of the house. And I mean, let's face it, Jamaican mothers will kick your ass. They're just some of the toughest things on earth but she's also somebody that I'm incredibly proud to call a friend and family to this day. So I actually did something a little out of the box on this particular deal. I put a rent to own sign in the front yard. I found some people that wanted to move in. I moved them in while I sold them the house and restored their credit. They paid me for I believe what was two months and that went towards their credit restoration and paying down some of the debt on their credit cards so they can actually get qualified to purchase this particular property. They lived inside of it. It was actually very inspirational. I didn't make that much money on it. I think I only made like 14 grand. But when you're at a closing table at the end of the day and you've got a family of four that you've reunited that never thought they'd be able to live together in their hometown of Teaneck, New Jersey, and they're sitting there crying, and then you tell the guy who is now actually homeless because he couldn't afford to pay for heat living outside of another property in Saddlebrook, New Jersey, sleeping in a car with his pregnant wife that you've paid off his mother's loan and you're going to be able to give him a few bucks and help his mother finally get that new kitchen that she wanted. It just brings tears to your eyes. It's something that doesn't ever really seem real to me to this day. It's like, wait a minute, I made all these people happy and I made an ass load of money. So I actually went with Linton. His mother took him back. They threw a party where 
His entire family was there. I'm the only white dude in the whole place in Jamaica that's going barbecue, by the way. Let me know when you're having that barbecue again because I can't wait for your grandma to cook and have that pulled everything. It's fire. And his mom called me over and his grandma was there too and they told me, my son is yours now. There is nothing he won't do for you. He will always protect you. He will follow you everywhere and look out for your best interest. I'm thinking to myself, like, all right, I'm waiting for the white people jokes, like, not really sure what's going on here. And naturally, when somebody gives you a gift, and honestly, it's one of the greatest gifts I've ever had in my life. He's my best friend to this day. I trust him more than any human being on planet Earth. You should reciprocate in some form. So, I asked Lynn's mom, Mrs. Gentles, is there anything you would like your son to do for you? And at this point, he was no longer homeless. He had just had his first child. What's going on, Olivia? How are you, baby? Godfather of all of them to this day. And uh, his mom said, I would like him to make an honest woman out of his wife, Natalie. So I waved him over. I said, Lytton, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to marry your girlfriend. And he looked at me, and he said, do you think it's a good idea? And I looked back at him and I said, yes. And we actually spent some time working on it. I can provide you guys with the video if you'd like to. It was later at one of our seminars where he actually proposed to Natalie, his loving wife, in front of something like a hundred people. But what amazed me most about Lynn is when I gave him a few bucks, he literally gave it right back to me and went, I know this stuff works. I just learned from the wrong side. I want to learn how to do it. A couple weeks later, we were teaching a seminar on how to buy and sell houses with little money, no credit, in the Crown Plaza in Paramus, and there was actually a flood. It was like one of those little mini hurricanes at the time. If I remember correctly, the year is 2006. It was two days. Day one was how to buy a house, and day two was how to sell it. And we gave everybody leads at the end of the first day, and to my amazement, that night, in a hurricane, Linton drove to Newark, New Jersey, and met with a distressed distress seller and came back the next morning with all the paperwork signed. And I was like, oh my God, I love this guy. This is what I need in my life. And he's actually taken the ball and learned things that I struggle with to this day, like bank negotiations and math. He is our short sale king. And he learned that from short sailing his house in Saddlebrook through a loss mitigator at a local bank that I was friends with, and rather than being compensated for the sale of this house, it's actually the worst deal I've ever done in my life. I was given a two carat rock from a diamond dealer that I used at that same seminar to propose to my future ex-wife, the prosecutor. You can't make this shit up. After that, we decided to work on Linton's third deal, which was the Montclair Mini Mansion, which was actually owned by his uncle, Jeffrey Washington, it was a hell of a short sale. Things did not go according to plan. We didn't even have the keys. I remember he told me I could go in. I called my lawyer, and I'm like, listen, I have the deed on this house. Can I break in? My lawyer was like, yeah, it's not breaking and entering. If you own it, and I'm trying to get in. The keys don't work. I get into the garage. I get an axe, and this thing's right across from, like, a middle school in Montclair. So I walked over to the front door on the Great Lawn, and I proceeded in broad daylight at 3 p.m. to chop down the front door with an axe. Till I heard, freeze, put your hands up, which I did immediately. And then the cops told me, turn around slow, which I did. And there was three cops on one knee with guns pointed at me. And they told me, what the f are you doing? Remain still, I went, sirs, I can explain. I just spoke to my lawyer. If you will go in my back pocket, there is a copy of the deed. I own this house. And they did. And then they told me, okay, fine. So technically, it's not breaking and entering if you're breaking into your own house, but motherfucker, did you have to chop the front door down with an axe in broad daylight? He's actually better at filing evictions than I am. He is better in court. He is a more polished gentleman than I could ever possibly hope to be. And sometimes I can't believe that when I met him, he was actually homeless, sleeping in a car. I'm incredibly proud of how far he's come. I, Honestly, I don't think I have any more solid relationship in my life, nor is there 
much that I am more proud of than the growth that he's exhibited and any role that I have played in that I don't know if I can even be completely credited for. He's got unique talent and drive and sometimes he keeps me straight and keeps me inspired. Over the years, Linton has done evictions for me. He's bought countless houses. I don't even view him as Linton anymore or me as myself. We are both Negan. We're one and the same. We even fit in the same clothes. He has the keys to my house. I'm the godfather of his kids. One time when I was on a business trip in Texas and my youngest daughter Helen, who has got some special needs, was in the hospital for a week and my ex couldn't stay with her during the day, Linton stood in as a surrogate father, feeding my daughter around the clock because nobody else can do it. Wow, I'm going to cry. You can't buy this kind of loyalty or relationship. I have been to court with him countless times, good and bad. He's actually thrown himself on the mercy of the court for me when he did not have to, and I've begged him again not to do that. I've watched him come full circle and become not only an investor, but a homeowner where he bought his home in North Jersey at 50 cents on the dollar using the same short sale process in the book that we've provided you guys with in the link. And I'm incredibly proud of him for that. In addition, he has actually taken the time out because we both partied quite a bit when we were younger. That happens when you make a lot of money. He has not only taken the time to find God and spiritually reconnect with Him, but he's actually come full circle and become a pastor. And he even runs his own church now with a massive following. He's one of the greatest preachers I've ever seen. I was there when he actually got inducted and became a pastor. I remember because I almost cried and the church itself took a moment to thank me for saving him. Fast forward years later, and you guys are getting to know me now, I can be a little bit of an adrenaline junkie, and uh, after training to climb my first mountain, I came down with Lyme disease, and after completely ignoring it, not even knowing that I had it, I was misdiagnosed with ringworm, and given corticosteroids to shut off my immune system, which is the worst thing you can do for somebody with Lyme disease. I then wound up neurologically paralyzed in a hospital bed for 10 days, and when my friends and family weren't able to be there, he was there. I even asked him the other day, how did I pee? Don't answer. Pretty amazing. He was there. God, I'm okay. He was there when I had to learn how to walk again. He was there. He was there when I had to kick massive amounts of painkillers, antidepressants, and prescription drugs. He was there when I got last rites. He was there when they made the decision to put a pick line in my heart because I didn't have enough veins to take the antibiotics needed to save me. So they decided to kill me off a little bit so that I could live. But fortunately, I'm such a bad mother my heart's not even damaged. Keep going for EKGs. He was there over the course of the following years when I was mismedicated again and put on something called Cymbalta, where if you're not somebody suffering from fibromyalgia or depression, it doesn't allow your body to get any REM sleep. He was with me through a period of time where I was actually clinically insane. He was there through the entire detox when I was out of my mind, thinking about actually offing myself remember it. I'll never forget it. He put me in one of our wrecked cars. <sighs> Drove me to the original house in Tienic where we met and told me, 
never told anybody this before, but we all go through tough shit. If I didn't meet you the day that I met you in that house, if you weren't able to solve that problem, the next step for me was the George Washington Bridge. I had no idea. He always told me I saved his life, and it wasn't until almost 15 years later when he saved mine that I was actually able to comprehend the situation that he was in. I'm sorry I'm getting a little emotional, but I felt like I really needed to get this out. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. And I pray that someday you have a relationship like this in your life. Chuck Kohau, always be closing. Smash the subscribe button. Slide it up to all. Bye for now. You do everything you can, cause you never gonna let it get by.